thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Peter, for having me. I love this bookstore. I love this room. Um, thank you, Gia, for coming out and being a part of this. Um, yeah, as Peter mentioned, uh, I've been on a whole journey with this book, and its paperback is coming out today, uh, which is exciting. I'd also just, um, I'm really pleased my mom is in the audience tonight. And I should just say, when this book came out in hardcover, my baby daughter was uh, three months old and I traveled to like 19 cities with her and it was all made possible by my mother joining us. So it means she has been to many, many events for this book, but is never in attendance. So uh, yeah, it's wonderful to actually have her in the room. Um, I'm going to read a few short sections from actually a little bit later in the book, although I don't really think they need introduction. And then we'll chat for a little bit. At the back of the composition book, filled with notes for recovery, his unfinished novel about his unfinished recovery, the poet John Berryman left behind a fairy tale called The Hunter in the Forest. He wrote it with his daughter, Martha, and most of it was transcribed in her effortful child's print. In the story, a hunter gets lost in a forest where two bears live, both named Hungry, quote, because they were always hungry every single second. They steal the hunter's food, put his gun in a squirrel hole, and take off his pants. That was a very angry hunter, the child wrote. Then they put him in a cage and lock the door. Though the story never frames it this way, these are the dilemmas of addiction. The bears are hungry every single second. The hunter is lost. The hunter is in a cage. Berryman and his daughter wrote four different endings, three of them in Berryman's cursive. He fixed the lock, got out of the cage, and conquered all the animals. That's the first ending. Second one is this. And they said, there, that's what you do to us. You're lucky we didn't kill you. Moral, be kind to animals, and they will be kind to you. The third ending. He awakened, and they fed him nothing but hay. One ending offered victory. The hunter triumphs over the animals. Another one offered a moral. If you are good to the world, it will be good to you. A third offered disappointment. Nothing but hay. Martha wrote the fourth ending in her serious, childish scrawl. She labeled it real ending. Quote, the hunter awakened and said, well, this final ending, the real ending, offered the true anticlimax of salvation. The hunter doesn't know what to make of the world he has woken into. Well, after waking up, there is always the question of what comes next. What life might lie beyond the life you've left behind? The first day of my second sobriety, I crashed my friend's car into a concrete wall. I'd borrowed his car because ours wasn't starting and I needed to get to my morning shift at the hospital so that medical students could diagnose my fake appendicitis. It was a frozen December day and I was jumpy and nervous, hungover and jittery. I need to stop. I don't want to stop. Stopping didn't work last time. My hands were having trouble staying still. And then I pulled into a parking space and hit the accelerator instead of the brakes and slammed right into the concrete wall. I remember thinking, oh shit. And then I wondered if I could pretend it hadn't happened. Do I definitely 
have to tell him. And yes, I did, because the front bumper was dangling like a loose band-aid, and one of the headlights had been cracked into a glass web. My immediate impulse was simply to back out and pull into another parking space, as if that would give me a do-over. I was trying to do the right thing, after all, get sober again. And today was supposed to be my big watershed, the first day of the rest of my life. Now, my reward for these intentions was this battered station wagon. I was indignant. If I was going to stop drinking, I was supposed to discover a spectacular new version of myself, or at least recover the presence of mind not to accelerate into a concrete wall. But sobriety didn't work like that. It works like this. You go to work. You call your friend. You say, I'm sorry I crashed your car into a wall. You say, you'll fix it. Then you do. One evening, in the dead of winter, I went to a sober ladies' night in a big house in the middle of an Iowa subdivision. The house belonged to a woman named Nell, and it was immaculate, with a brown leather living room set and a white shag rug. It was eerie, the clean and polish of everything, the hanging metal saucepans gleaming in their dangling rows. It seemed lonely. From her shares in meetings, I knew that Nell's husband was struggling with her relapses. We were having game night. Someone had brought balderdash. Someone had brought apples to apples, where one player dealt a card with an adjective, expensive, useful, rich. And everyone else had to play a noun from the cards in her hand. Switzerland, igloo bank robber. A woman named Lori had made banana muffins still steaming in their basket, wrapped in cloth. A woman named Ginger brought turkey pot pie, and Val brought something called chicken surprise made of five different kinds of beige, cream of this, cream of that, milk and grated cheese and mayonnaise. I could remember sweating straight rum onto my sheets, kissing a man at dawn with coke crackling through my veins, getting woozy on a lawn full of fireflies. That was living. I'd been so sure of it. This night was several kinds of casserole. I'd brought cookies from the bakery where I worked. Wherever I went, I brought cookies from the bakery where I worked in a pink box speckled with tiny archipelagos of grease. Nell took them from me, excited, and I felt like a child, so pleased by her pleasure, by the primal buzz of food passing from my hands to hers. It was nice to be useful, even in the smallest way. Nell's husband was a lawyer who worked long hours and had always wanted a kid, though Nell's drinking was making it hard for them to imagine having one. As Nell showed me around, she pointed out her old hiding spots for bottles, a paper bag under the kitchen sink, behind the cleaning supplies, an old camping bag in the garage where she'd rolled them in blankets. I remembered listening for Dave's key in the lock, drinking the last of the gin, brushing my teeth so hard my gums bled. That night, we played charades. We played it hard. We played apples to apples. We drew trustworthy and someone put down Canadians, then someone won with whiskey, a wild card that had been added, handwritten. We drew desperate and I wanted to put down board games. We poured our Diet Coke from liter bottles. Middle-aged women in pastel cardigan sweaters talked about shooting heroin into parts of the body I didn't know it could be shot into. We talked about how to get through a day without the old horizons of relief, and there was relief in that. In hearing another person just say how fucking hard it was for her as well, just the simple act 
of living in the world without anything to blunt its edges. The longer I spent in Nell's house, the more amazing she seemed to me, just getting up each day in a home full of the ghosts of her old hidden bottles, facing up to the husband she disappointed, trying to own the pieces of her life again, trying to do, as I was hearing people say in meetings, the next right thing. Driving home, I imagined me and all these women getting drunk together in a bar somewhere, totally sloppy, doing the one thing that connected all of us but that we'd never do together. I wanted to meet the people these women had been when they were drunk. The din and revelry of that impossible night was like noise from another room, something muffled behind a door. I recognized whatever remained in Nell that made her want to point out exactly where the bottles had been, under there, up there, tucked in there. I imagined her back in her empty house in its dark subdivision, sweeping up pastry crumbs, wiping down surfaces that were already clean, fighting the swallowing quiet. One part of me was sorry that she couldn't just grab a vodka bottle from the camping backpack and sink into that sweet, clean stupor, but another part of me believed in this aftermath, its daily accumulations. Don't leave before the miracle happens, another woman told me, and I thought, sure, okay, but also wanted to know when. I wanted to know the exact date of the miracle day, month, and year, for me and for Nell, so I could tell her, just hold out till then. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, I just wanted to say, I was just thinking about while you were reading, I think we met when I was in grad school and you came through Ann Arbor on your book tour, because you were friends with one of my professors, and I remember the conversation I had with my best girlfriend in the program. I was in a fiction program, and we were at the bar afterwards. We were like, oh, books like this. Like, we could, we could write a book like this. Like, like people, people want, I remember it felt so amazing that your book existed and that, uh, that people loved it. And I just have been like working on the end stages of my, my own book, as you know, and I, I'm, gl I'm grateful to you because I don't think, I don't know if I would have known that I could write this way. And certainly I don't know if anyone would have bought it without your work <laughs> there first, so thank you. It's actually amazing, I was on the subway coming here, I was telling my mom that we had met at Literati all those years really ago. Really a long time ago, then, it yeah, feels like, yeah. It was, it was a while back, but then it was so exciting yeah. to have met you and then to yeah. watch your work start just like lighting up the world, so. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here. Um, so let's let's just situate ourselves in the origin of this book. I um, it's my understanding that it's sort of your graduate thesis is where some bulk of it began, and I was wondering if you could talk about that and how you envisioned it then, and when you dropped it, when you dropped the project, and when you picked it up, how it was different. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So in a way, sometimes I think about the story of the book as like the confluence of a couple of different tributaries or something. There's this moment, there's a quote in the book from Jean Rhys, um, who was a brilliant woman and a terrible alcoholic, um, when she's talking about, she's imagining literature as a series of, um, you know, great rivers. And so she imagines, you know, Hemingway as a, as a great river and these canonical Shakespeare is a great river and then she says, you know, Jean Rhys is a little tributary on the side. I actually think she thought she was more than a tributary, but I think of this book sometimes as, as um, with a similar like visual map in my mind of not, not that I'm either a great river or a little tributary of literature, but this idea that it had, there was one point of origin for this book that was really the early fragments of writing that I was doing when I got sober that were trying to transcribe just what it felt like uh, in that way to move through the world without anything to blunt its edges. Um, I had no plans for what those fragments of writing would be. They felt like a way of surviving those moments by writing them down. Um, and so there were a bunch of files on my computer that were um, writing about the kind of like I got sober in Iowa, and so early sobriety for me was full of a lot of like 
cold and harsh light and the, you know, pathetic fallacy writ large, like everything felt like a metaphor for how, do you know, it's so dark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was very dark. I actually, I knew a woman, um, who <laughs> got sober on the shortest day of the year. And oh she said God. that the mercy of it was, yeah, it was depressing for all sorts of reasons, but the, the mercy of it was like, if you're just taking it one day at a time, like it's every, like every day is a better, short yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think um, there was this sort of very personal, fragmentary um, writing about what it had felt like to get sober and then starting to kind of look back at the drinking and what it had been. And then when I returned to the PhD program that I had been in, I had had another, a completely different idea for my dissertation, but I felt um, I had this kind of urgent curiosity about what it had looked like for other writers and artists when they had gotten sober. I felt like I had really been like inundated with with um, a lot of stories about the relationship between addiction and creativity, and I just hadn't heard stories about the relationship between recovery and creativity or sobriety and creativity, and I had spent a lot of nights in early sobriety like sitting in overly lit coffee shops, like trying really, really fucking hard to write. So um, I, I I designed this dissertation project as a kind of, I think at a certain point I call it speculative autobiography, like thinking about these other lives as a way of imagining maybe what my life as somebody who was sober and trying to be creative could be. So, you know, I started going to archives, Charles Jackson's archive, Jean Reese's archive, um, David Foster Wallace's archive, John Berryman's archive, and was looking literally at how getting sober and uh, for in some cases how 12-step recovery had spoken to their creative lives and how they, in many cases, they tried to generate a new sort of creative self out of what was happening to them. So that was sort of another tributary um, that ended up at a certain point. I said, you know, the version of this book that I want to write isn't a scholarly monograph and it's not a straight memoir. It's, it's asking a lot of questions and kind of coming at them with everything I've got, my own life, these other lives. Yeah, you've talked about writing this book being like standing in a room and the walls just keep like falling down or expanding or moving on you. And you ended up with this structure, which I pictured like a braid with a piece of fabric through it, which was like your your story, story of writers and artists who got sober, um, ordinary people, so to speak, who got sober, and then the history of addiction cutting through it. You also, I was, I was reading an old Q&A and you said you would cut 100,000 words out of the manuscript at some point. And I'm wondering about that and I'm wondering about if there was anything that comes to mind as something you really wanted to keep but it didn't work structurally. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of things you wanted yeah. to keep. But. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think yeah, sometimes when I say that, I'm fully aware of the absurdity of it because it's still, it's like to imagine this book plus 100,000 words, no. it's like well, ungodly, And this right? being like any book, you, you lose 40, <laughs> yeah. no matter what, right? Like yeah, it's like, yeah. you, as you should. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can bring, my editor Ben is <laughs> here. He can speak to the, the yeah, um, the sometimes painful process of um, figuring out what needed yeah. to be I'm there. I'm wondering, like, was there another structural chunk or something yeah. that you had? That yeah, I mean, so I think a lot of, a lot of it had to do with a kind of, philosophical transition in my mind from thinking about, it was always part of my vision for this book that it would work in some way uh, like a meeting where right. you're, you're sort of in this echo chamber of stories. And so my story was gonna be one of them, but there were gonna be all these other stories that were part of it. And I think initially I was very committed to this idea that it was almost like the narrative chunks of, of people's stories, my own and others were we're just gonna like stand next to each other without a lot of thematic overdetermination. Like in a meeting, you just hear one person share, you hear another person share, your mind is making all these connections, but there's something like, mm -hmm. it's almost like Stonehenge with all these just like blocks. And I, I think the one of the big edits of the book involved saying, most of this material is gonna stay, but like the unit size of each portion is gonna get a lot smaller and I'm going to think about each section not just as like a big block of story but as something structured by a couple of questions mm -hmm. like how do you narrate relapse or like what does it mean to come back into recovery when recovery hasn't worked for you the first time or think and so letting the sections tighten a little bit more around ideas or questions mm -hmm. um was kind of as opposed to say going through the whole thing and just like trying to take out enough individual sentences that I was somehow going to make it something like, right. you know, bring it to its fighting weight or. Yeah. Well, 
Right, and so the idea was always gonna be, like you were saying, this, you're writing into what may seem like a contradiction or what apparent, what appeared to you as a contradiction for a long time, which was, you know, that you, you know, as writers, as readers, we think that stories should be exceptional. Um, you had had this particular relationship to that idea, you know, that things should be like, you know, they should use, you write, you know, they should be sparkling, they should be, you know, they should be singular. This like instinctive narrative belief in that, and then recovery asks you to trust the opposite, that they're, the important thing is that they are unexceptional and possibly cliche, right? And so this book is in, you know, you're writing straight into that mm -hmm. and asking whether that contradiction is real, what it's made of, and how it could possibly re be resolved. And I was wondering, I mean, there's one way in which, you know, the, the obvious resolution is that the story, the, st the content of the story is unexceptional, but the way you tell it mm -hmm. isn't, right? So it's a content versus style thing. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about that contradiction and if how many, like nine months out after publication, like I'm wondering if your understanding of it has shifted even since publication, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think I think that the the resolution to the contradiction that in some sense I believe in is partially what you're describing that, you know, um what makes a story worth hearing isn't necessarily uh it doesn't have to be its content, but it can be its mode of expression. Um but I also think I also think I was just interested in examining how storytelling might serve different purposes in different realms. So like what we, that it, it doesn't, the contradiction doesn't need to be fully resolved in the sense that we reach a place where we think, oh, literary stories should serve exactly the same function as stories in a recovery meeting or stories that are designed for some sort of therapeutic goal. Um, but I was just interested in those differences. Like how does the very thing that I had been trained to believe made a story worthwhile in these literary worlds that I had grown up in, that it was original, you know, the from the modernist saying, like, make it new, which was itself not an original statement, but this idea of, like, kind of originality and that, you know, in recovery, I was so struck by just the fact that it was not just that recovery wasn't revered in the same way, but that precisely the opposite thing was right. what made a story worthwhile at all. So I was, I guess I was thinking both about certain literary resolutions to that contradiction and also the way in which, like, storytelling um, just does different work and and even some of the the depending on what sort of sphere it's happening in and some of the people that I looked at in the book like there were a number of authors as we've talked about but um you know I also do quite a bit of analysis of um how Bill Wilson one of the co-founders of, of Alcoholics Anonymous crafted his own story for for different audiences in very different ways. So when he was telling his story to the New England Journal of Medicine, he focused much more fully on kind of um, social camaraderie as a form of healing and much less on his like, spiritual experience of like feeling the wind b blow through his body on a mountaintop. When he spoke about um, you know, his uh, experience of getting sober in support of experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs, he talked a lot more about the spiritual dimension because mm -hmm. he was like, these drugs can actually help other people access this sort of mystical moment. So that idea of like, you know, we might craft a story in very different ways depending on what we want it to do was, was one of the kind of threads that was helping me look at that contradiction. And then in terms of how it's changed since the book's been published, um, you know, one of the things that my editor and I talk quite a bit about and one of the things I was really committed to in this book was a set of stories that were more reported stories from a group of people who went through a rehab center in, in um, Maryland in the 70s called Seneca House. And I... Could you talk about Seneca House just a little bit? Like just yeah. 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 So Seneca House, I, I discovered Seneca House, or Seneca House discovered me um, because I had written a, a piece for the New York Times book review about cliches that was not about recovery, but in a certain subtextually it kind of was. It was really inspired by the way that cliches worked in recovery. Um, and I got some correspondence about that piece um, from this, this elderly man in Maryland who said, you know, uh, you love cliches and I love cliches and here's why I love cliches. And he ha was also coming from a recovery background and said, you know, I would love to tell you the story of this little rehab that I was involved in. And you hadn't in. written about recovery in that essay and he just no. came in with that? That's yeah, amazing. It was like a, yeah, there's like a dog whistle that. quality. That would happen all the time with um, 
empathy exams too, which isn't explicitly about recovery at all, but all the time people in recovery could hear mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. in that book and would often say something like that to me about it. Um, and yeah, so he, he wanted to tell me the story of this place and there was something about it that immediately captured my imagination. Like it had been, uh, it had been a, a fishing hostel on the shores of the Potomac and it was this kind of slightly decrepit, falling down wooden building that a couple of guys decided to turn into a rehab center and, and there was this like real collection of characters who had moved through it. And it was exactly the kind of thing, like as you said, like people, you know, that w you kind of put some kind of scare quotes around it, like ordinary people. And uh, so I wanted to include some of those stories precisely because I believe, I believe every story is dynamic, not only if you tell it in the right way, but if you ask the right questions of that experience. And, um, you know, and it was interesting when the book came out, like lots of people really dug the Seneca House stories, but I always knew they were kind of a risk, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not exceptional, they're not famous people. Um, and some people loved those stories, but then there were other people who s sort of still had that response of like, what what have what's, these- what What's have the special? Yeah, yeah, what have these people done to sort of earn entry? Yeah. And so there was a part, I mean, that either means like I didn't, I didn't totally do my job, um, but I think it also speaks to this way that the hunger for exceptionality as a sort of um, prerequisite for either telling a story or listening to it, um, there's something really persistent and durable in that desire. Well, it was it was interesting too. I was going back and you know and, and reading lots of stuff from around publication, and it was funny because you know recovery asks you to accept that you're not you know, this, the grand exception that you believe, you know, like this, like this shooting star that's gonna, you know, whatever, like you have to subdue that to, you know, what you, you called it like something like prayer, just, just letting yourself be, you know, like inhabit these cliches and, sub and, and subdue yourself to them. And, but you know, and a lot of, there were a lot of people who read this book and I'm interested, and I wanted to talk to you about this. Like they, they wanted you to focus solely on yourself, to assert yourself as exceptional more than you do in the book. Um, and, and you know, th that hunger, it's hard to tell whether it's a literary one, a narrative one, or it's a culture, you know, like it's, yeah. it's complicated, right? And, and so, and it's like, but your writing is exceptional. And so is it that, I'm wondering how you read all of that tenor of reaction, was it that people wanted you to sort of conceal your exceptional qualities better? Or yeah. do you know what I mean? Like what did, how did that feel and what, how did you process it? Well, it's yeah, it's a great question. There are like so so it's many different ways yeah. I can answer it. I mean, and and but I mean, I think you know probably one answer is that I wish I'd had fewer conversations with people in my mind about their reactions to the book. Um, but I think I also felt really blessed, and and I am going to actually answer the substance of your question because I think it's really interesting. Um, but just like on an experiential level, I. Um, I felt so lucky that my daughter was a baby when this book came out, not only because I love her deeply and I'm glad that she's in the world, but also because I there was a way in which I couldn't get as probably wrapped up in the reception of the book as I would have if I wasn't still just like waking up every day and like changing diapers yeah. and nursing, you know, every three hours. And so there was a way that I was kind of constantly brought back to like physicality and living and and sort of the or the ordinariness of my own existence because in a way I think recovery, that particular strain of recovery, this idea that like what you've lived isn't exceptional, was felt like this bespoke uh, preparation for, for motherhood itself, which uh -huh. is both like an experience that makes you wanna kind of like cry out to anybody who will listen about how intense it is and, and how complicated it is, but it's also like kind of literally the most common experience mm -hmm. that one can possibly have. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like I was like living that yeah. Yeah. in my life. Right. It, it's not specific it. to the situation, like yeah. it is, yeah. 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 Um, but I also, I think, um, one thing I, I took from that was just that people, and you can have this even in the dynamic of like a, a workshop, right, is like one person wants, so much more of Uncle Joe, and another person is like, get rid of Uncle Joe, totally, right. and you know, and as a teacher, I sometimes try to resolve that by being like, it just means like Uncle Joe isn't doing his job, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> but like, but I think, I think there's also a way that it's just like different people want different things, and right. what somebody, right. especially when it comes to addiction, like, mm -hmm. what somebody wants from a book about addiction can be so many things. Like one person might bring a certain kind of baggage where they want, they want to see the addict like 
even if they're not admitting it to themselves, they want to see the addict sort of punished or humbled. Right. Somebody else might bring a kind they of They want to see a lower in. bottom. They want yeah. to see... Yeah. yeah, exactly. Somebody else might want to see recovery figured in a certain way, right. want, 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 want to see more skepticism about recovery or less skepticism about right. recovery. Um, so I was just... I was, I was made viscerally aware of the way that w what somebody... The experience that somebody has reading a book is so much about them in addition to the book, which is both, you know, it can be a kind of protective thing, right? Like, oh, that was just about them. But it's also, I think, a necessary humility where it's like, so often when somebody loves a book, it's, it's yes, it's about the book, but it's also about something they needed to hear. And this it. is like baked into everything you're writing about anyway, right? It's yeah. like, like well, how we hear stories and yeah. what need they serve for us at that certain yeah. time and how they could be yeah. completely, the same story is completely different 10 years on. Um, I was thinking, when I was thinking about this like exceptional question, I was, I was thinking about, there was something, no one wrote about it like this, but I was wondering, there was a lot of, the underlying questions behind it seemed to do with will and longing to me, and not being able to square certain things. Like you write, you wrote about so much of your life being driven by will and longing in various combinations. You wrote about dealing with anorexia when you were younger. It's sort of using your will to resist longing. And then drinking is sort of giving in to longing in a way that negates the force of will. But then in your writing itself, which is constant throughout all of it, like will and longing are, they never drop. They're very, very, they're, they're constant, you know, unyielding presences. And I think people had a hard time understanding how the way you write isn't always the way you live. You know, it was it was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there. Um, yeah, I love that read of the those sort of twin forces in the book of of will and longing and thinking about how um, there they sort of suggest different versions of like what constitutes the self. Like, are yeah. we constituted by like what we desire, or in some sense by like what we can. Right. make or, f or force into being um and you know I think I think in that sense they're both connected to what we've been talking about so far which is like what what gives a person value or worth mm -hmm. and is it like simply that um is it is it sort of simply being in some way or is there some way in which one has to like kind of like redeem or prove oneself right. as a person there was something somebody said um, that I quote in the book that I, it's like one of the most moving things I've ever heard, which was an old man who um, was a recovering heroin addict who said, he said, I love being hungry because it's my body telling me it wants to be alive. And um, that idea of sort of, you know, in the framework you were mentioning, like longing itself as a kind of, um, we can see it as like a barometer of insufficiency, but it's also like a barometer of vitality, yeah. like that, yeah, 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 yeah. to long. Can you talk more about, so, you know, this started with a question about sobriety's relationship to creativity. It became a personal question, you know, as you were uh, living the experiences that produced this book. And, and it's, I was thinking about, I mean, part of the, part of the, like the, what this book does is, you know, particularly with the stories of the other writers, there is not an answer for what sobriety does. Um, you know, there's, there's this, you know, it's so complicated. You write about how Raymond Carver, you know, I, I didn't realize that the versions of the Raymond Carver stories I loved had crushed his heart because he had gotten sober yeah. and his editor had taken all of the, I had, I had read the two different versions of A Small Good Thing and been like, oh, I love the clipped cold one, you know? Yeah. And I realized that, and I'm reading this book, I was like, oh, he had gotten sober and he had put some sort of like empathy that read a sen sentiment to his editor and they had gotten cut. Mm -hmm. There were other people, you know, who did, who, who did their best work, like Dennis Johnson got sober and stayed sober, and, and then there are people like, you know, it's it's such a, there is there is no narrative like getting sober will ruin it, ruin your creativity, there's no narrative like getting sober will make you a better writer than you ever were before, there's, you know, and there, are, you write about people like Billie Holiday, Amy Winehouse, who, you know, maybe they would have been, like maybe Amy Winehouse would be, I mean, I, I tend to think she'd have been a genius if she, I mean, she'd still be producing yeah. on the level she was, but maybe she wouldn't have, yeah. you know, if she had, and how, I'm wondering if you just talk about that and how it was to, to just work into that multiplicity where there is like necessarily no satisfying answer. Yeah, I mean, I think part of, um, 
part of what I was drawn to or ended up really appreciating about having so many different stories in the book, though it wasn't why I decided to include so many stories. I really was motivated by that idea of like creating a meeting or creating an echo chamber. But I realized like when you only tell one story, like if you're only telling your own story in a memoir or you're only telling somebody else's story in a biography or a profile, even if you're not holding up that story as like a moral or a rule, um, it can sometimes kind of read that way, like w right. especially when it comes to addiction and we have all these ideas about the kind of types of stories that are told, like either the kind of like irredeemable downward spiral or like the uplifting redemption story, like that if you just tell one story, there's necessarily just one way the story ends. Somebody gets sober and stays sober. Somebody gets sober and makes great work. Somebody gets sober and their work is shit, you know, like, but by having so many stories that actually felt like the book could be honest mm -hmm. in a, like it could manifest rather than just like hollowly articulate a certain kind of honesty about like exactly what you're saying. This can go so many different ways. There is no one way it goes. And that letting that irresolution um, hang felt so Im important to me because I think sometimes we're so, there can be something so terrifying about addiction that we can, we can want to kind of s slot it into if thens or somehow contain it by putting it into narrative categories, but sort of just like letting all those different paths the story can take sit alongside each other. Um, that jaggedness was something that I actually ended up really kind of loving as right. a byproduct of the structure of the book. Right, it's like, it's really hard to fight the idea that narrative should be prescriptive, like even, like on this subject maybe more than almost yeah. any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I was wondering if you could talk about, so you, I was wondering if you could talk about the writing the memoir parts of this, if you had to re-report your own life mm -hmm. and what that was like and how you how you did it and how your sense of those years changed as you did it. Yeah, and I would love, I don't, I don't, I, you can pick it up if you want to and not if you don't, but I would be actually really curious to hear how, like I know oh. little bits and pieces of in your book, but what that it's been process wild. of research has <laughs> yeah. been like, yeah, for you watching the TV program, but, um, yeah, I think I did do I did do some like reporting and I think of my own life and I think part of that was coming from the process of spending so much time in archives. I I started to approach my own life as a set not only or exclusively but a, among other things as a kind of set of archives. Mm -hmm. Um not, you know, so I I did read like, you know, my my journals and and uh for many of the years that I write about and didn't just find like content in those journals, but even often found like a kind of <sighs> typographical sadness because I would also mm -hmm. journal drunk. So like right. I would I would see sort of like the sober self trying to make sense of mm -hmm. what I felt and mm -hmm. then like the entry from later that night where I was just like, I'm sad, yeah. you know, and you see the letters getting really yeah, big. Reading and yourself makes sense of something in real time in a way that's different yeah. from how you later, it's the wildest. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Because you can kind of, I, well, I, I would be curious how it feels for you, but I, I feel usually both um, a kind of uncomfortable affinity with that yeah. former self yeah. and also, you know, some distance, right? It's like I sort of see her seeing partial contours of something, but um, mm -hmm. but also often see it in a different way. Um, so yeah, so journals, my um, my Gmail accounts were also, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've gone down that rabbit <laughs> hole in your own writing about your life, but it's, it's really kind of amazing, like, because it's like, you, I would always go in looking for something like, oh, you know, how, wh what kinds of things were going on in our relationship when we made this move or, or across the country or something like that. But I would always find things that I had forgotten. So like in this book, at a certain point, I write about trying to revitalize or believe again in a relationship that was struggling. And I had totally forgotten that we had joined one of those um, CSAs, like the mm -hmm. Community of Farm Shares. And, and so I, I just discovered in my account all these emails that I hadn't deleted about like zucchini mm -hmm. cake recipes and that we could make with our little farm boxes. And, you know, <laughs> Some friends who read the book were like, you need to cut this shit, it's so twee. Um, and I, he I heard I heard them, I heard yeah, what they yeah. were saying. But <laughs> to me, like, what I found in those was like that I wanted so badly to believe, like, if I just did X, Y, or Z, it could save this, it could save this relationship. And I saw in my, like, desire to, like, use every 
kohlrabi or something like that. Oh, yeah. Like this, There's always so much that, kohlrabi. Like, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> um, that so I I think it's like that's that was the stuff that was exciting was to be kind of surprised mm -hmm, by these mm -hmm. like little weird fragments. Right, of, you're like leaving like, yourself yeah. breadcrumbs yeah, in a way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Take you into stuff and um, and then people read the you know I I um, try to show manuscripts or portions of manuscripts to people who appear in them whenever I can. And so particularly like the primary romantic relationship that's in this narrative, um, that partner read, uh, that former partner read like two versions of the manuscript. And that was a really intense kind of re-reporting, right? To yeah. be <laughs> talking. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like you're fact checking with the like most. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's interesting. I, I've been going through my old, like I've kept, I kept like a, you know, regular journal ever since I was 12, you know, and, you know, meticulously recorded everything I did that day. And one thing that terrified me... How many years me, did you... Did you... Until I started getting paid to write. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, it's one of the things, and it's, like, actually maybe going to be the... Th it's maybe the underlying thesis of my book that one thing that I have always been scared of is that my ability to make narrative sense of something might be leading me, it's like just as easily might be leading me away from whatever is true as leading me towards it. And part of what um, reminds me of that possible facility is that I can watch myself convincing myself in old journals or whatever, old emails, and I'm sometimes convincing myself of something that's really you know diametrically wrong and but I was persuasive because I you know could write myself into right this understanding and it and I've been thinking about that a lot lately because like literally probably is the thesis of my book or just an underlying thing about it and you and I was reading an interview with you like a couple of days ago and you were saying and I've been a I'm wondering if you have ever shared that fear <laughs> and B if you 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 wrote or you said in some interview there's nothing false in shape in shaping and reshaping these stories mm -hmm. that it's actually this inevitable and generative part of being human mm -hmm. and I found that consoling as I but as I've been going through you know I mean I was just going through a fact check at at work today and I was like you know my brain like you can't we can't trust what we yeah. think about anything yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. and going through archives you know even reporting something really low you know trying to unearth something really low stakes about your own life as I've been doing um I'm always just like fuck I was totally wrong I totally yeah. missed it yeah. you know yeah, yeah, but yeah, I can yeah. feel myself like dropping these little breadcrumbs for mm -hmm. you know I these little unself-aware acknowledgments of the thing that I would come to a decade later or something. Yeah, it's very, I, I completely resonate with the ways in which like doing any kind of repertorial work, really, I think if you're being authentic and responsive to that work, it necessarily like just unsettles your whole relationship to your own memory. Because I remember when I started, when I, the, when I started to record interviews, like I was horrified by, I think I have like a pretty decent memory, yeah. but I would be horrified by the way that like within minutes of finishing the interview, I was already distorting like pretty much everything they had right, said. Right, you just so can't like remember what they're wearing, pieces. you know, yeah, and you're yeah. just like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I would just have this whole narrative about how they were like, you know, seemed to have this like very angry relationship with their father and then I would, you know, listen right. back and it would actually- You're transcribing and you're like, oh, like, oh no, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think there's a way that like that was, um, actually doing some that cause some of that kind of work asked me to approach writing about my own life in a different way that had to you know do with sort of distrusting memory and I absolutely have shared that I don't know that sense of the kind of double-edged sword of narrative sense making where it both like <laughs> entices you to reduce something or kind of get yourself mentally where you need to go um but that that you know I think Maybe for me, I, I went on a real back, a kind of a, a swing towards skepticism for a long time where I was like, you know, in love with Joan Didion's The White Album and this idea of this kind of skeptical idea of like, you know, when we tell ourselves stories in order to live, we're, we're not willing to face reality and all of its complexity. But I think with, with this book, and I referenced Didion at one point explicitly in this vein, it's like, I'm like, you know, there's something that feels too easy to me about mm -hmm. being so wholly skeptical of narrative sense making. Like actually narrative sense making not only like does a lot of productive things to help us survive, but like just because something's kind of a smooth, polished little stone doesn't mean it's a lie. Right. And it might be a different stone 10 years later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, just one more question before we open it up. Um, your new book, 
the cover was just revealed. Also, by the way, there's a bottle on the cover of this paperback, which I didn't realize the road is a bottle. That's secret, crazy. Bottle. Um, but I was wondering if you could just talk about talk about the new book. You all you wrote in the little essay that it com- that you've been working on it for a long, long time. So you, it's not as if you because I was like, well, how does Leslie already have a new book? Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't write it in the period between now and like that and this. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, just talk about it a little. Right, yeah, with the baby. Um, yeah, yeah I think. Like, oh, she's a new baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny that, the, yeah, I, I actually really, really, I like, I'm uh, really in love with the cover of this paperback. Yeah. And I, I was just like, as I was explaining before we left, like I, when the hardcover came out, um, there had been quite a bit of dialogue between me and my publisher about whether or not there was going to be a bottle or a glass on the cover. Um, and then it was so funny when I saw the paperback, I was like, oh, no bottle or glass. Yeah. And then I was like, wait. <laughs> I was like, oh, actually, <laughs> there it is. Um, but I, yeah, I love it. That's I love great. it in the road. I would never I would never <laughs> have seen it, but I'm very stupid about this. I think it was just like the little whiskey label kind of part way up mm. um, that gave it away for me. Um, yeah, so the the... The, <laughs> the, <cover. laughs> <Sorry>. um, <laughs> the um yeah the 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 new book um is coming out in september and it's called make it scream make it burn it's another collection of essays and What's the poem that part of that comes from or so it's, it's not a poem it's actually it's from uh, a piece of critical writing that uh william carlos williams gotcha. the poet um wrote a review of walker evans photographs oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and he says that and he's he's writing specifically about some of the very famous photographs that um were part of james Agee's let us now praise famous men um repertorial project and um william carlos williams says that part of what walker evans photographs do is that they take ordinary reality and make it scream um not i think in the sense of pain but in the sense of urgency like they f- they find something truly urgent in it um and so i i was w- in that phrase make it scream make it burn i was thinking about exactly the kind of attention that we were talking about earlier like how to pay a kind of close attention to existence that finds this like wild pulse inside of it um but the essays are about i've been working on it for about eight years and they're about um, all kinds of things that uh, this whale that has become known as the loneliest I'm, whale. I'm never going to read that because it's going to ruin my life. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but it's like I, exactly whenever I read about that whale, I'm like ruined for a month. <laughs> I know. Get strong before you read it. But it's yeah. really, it's actually yet another example of what we were talking about. People find in the whale what they need to find yeah, in the whale. It's true. So you will find what you <laughs> need true. to I find. I'm always in trying to cry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. And it's a lot about will and longing, actually. So it was kind of um, amazing that you pointed to those things in this book as well, because I guess it's just proof that like wherever we go, there we are. And we kind of keep returning to the same obsessions. Um, but yeah, they're a real mixture of some big reported pieces. There's a piece about reincarnation, a piece about um, second life and online avatars and what those do for people. And then some more personal pieces, um, piece about eloping and Las Vegas, a uh, piece about pregnancy. Um, but yeah, they're all thinking about desire. And the epigraph is from Marilyn Robinson's novel, Housekeeping. Um, the moment, yeah, it's a good one. Um, I, you know, I think I would have just made the whole novel my epigraph if yeah, I could yeah, have. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's this moment where um, the novel asks, when do our senses know anything so utterly as when we lack it? And thinking about how we're kind of constituted by things we can't quite have or touch or hold or know um, was one of those questions that when I look over all those pieces, I realized I was like, they're about quite different things, but there was this animating question about kind of lack and longing that was inside of all of them. Cool. Um, All right. Anyone have any questions? Hello. First off, I loved your book. Um, So we were talking a little bit about that hunger for exceptionality versus the role of cliches in the recovery setting. And in one part in the book, you were talking about that moment and that build up to when you were actually ready to share your story at AA. And you get up there, you've built up the confidence, you're sharing the story, and someone yells out, this is boring. And so for me, I'm like, oh my god, it's like one of my worst (laughs) worst nightmares. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about that experience and how you thought about um, maybe advice you've given to others who are looking to share their story and trying to find the right confidence and balance of being exceptional, but just being cool with sharing what their story is. Even when people are judging, like, is her story real enough? Is it serious enough? Yeah, what a 
thoughtful question. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe one moral of the story is somebody can literally yell at you that your story is boring and you remain undeterred and write a 500 page <laughs> book about it anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, one of the things I was thinking about when I was structuring this book is that I, it took me a while to get there and some, some, some feedback from readers, but I, I ended up, I ended up opening the book with that anecdote, um, both to kind of set up some of the core questions around what makes a story worthwhile and to sort of bring, um, bring recovery onto the page in a way that felt sort of complicated and textured and admitted all of those insecurities and vulnerabilities, but also because I really wanted to open the book with that anecdote and then return to that moment uh, kind of once we get there within the chronological narrative to also narrate like what happened immediately after, a, a few beats after, the sort of man stood up to yell, this is boring, which is that the person sitting sitting next to me, you know, then said, y you just told my story and it was incredible to hear it. You know, and that idea that um, sort of past a certain kind of shame at the ways a story can be judged is this, this truth that it can still be useful and you, do, you don't always know and you kind of can't always know like why or how the story is going to be useful and the very things that might make you feel ashamed of it are precisely the reasons that it that it will be useful to somebody else and so i, I kind of wanted to set up the the problem of that moment or what was painful about that moment in order to also set up like yeah and then the moment kept going and there was another side to it Hi. So funny enough, coincidentally, my question's about boredom. Um, so I know you spoke earlier about how addiction and substance use has a way of um, blunting the edges and the sharp moments of life. But I also know in addiction and recovery, substance use also has a way of sharpening the dull moments and making life's mundane go away in a way that is something that someone who's not undergoing a substance use situation builds those means of dealing with the small boredoms, the little problems that someone who's going through a long-term addiction utilizes substances as a means of dealing with. And I often know in fiction and stories and memoirs, that aspect of addiction is often less than the side because it's not very cinematographic. Dealing with boredom, figuring out, as you said, I'm in a room full of ladies playing board games and my body is recognizing a moment when I felt fireworks in the air and cocaine crackle through my system. And so my question is to you, if you want to speak about boredom within the recovery process and also capturing, and I don't want to say dramatizing boredom, but presenting in a way that is encompassing in the addiction experience and not left aside. Yeah, yeah what a great question. And as you were asking, I was thinking about this, uh, I mean, there are so many poignant Amy Winehouse quotes, but w one of them, and, and it shows up at a certain point in this in this book, is from the night when she won all of her Grammys, and and she was sober, but not for long, and sh and she just said everything is so boring without drugs, you know, and that idea that you know we can like win Grammys and it still it, it still feels that way, and and that I think it's it's like there's an experiential dimension of it, and then there's also just like a. a physiological dimension, I mean, for many kinds of addiction, right? I'm writing a forward right now to a anthology of reporting about the opioid epidemic and which is truly brutal and necessarily and like usefully brutal thing to read about kind of o over and over again. And in that, and maybe this gets to your question as well, like in that over and over again-ness of those stories, but I mean, just the kind of the way that the, the, the brain is actually being primed by addiction to experience the absence of that substance as kind of um, not just craving, but but often like deep boredom that there's nothing there if there's not the substance there. Um, so I think there are, there are ways to talk about it in in these kind of rich, robust psychological senses of like what is what does it mean to like wake up to your own life without substances, but also ways that it's really important to honor just like the 
the physiological component of like where boredom comes from and how addiction sort of shapes our experience of say boredom in sobriety or early sobriety. Um, and I think there's, there's, <sighs> when I was writing this book, I was trying to think about, um, and this is part of what I love about your question, like I was trying to think about how to do justice to tedium and not elide like tedium and boredom from the story um, without hopefully like subjecting the reader to the actual experience of tedium or boredom, um, which is like a, you know, a tricky subject. And I think anybody who's like ever tried to write or experienced feedback on writing or been in those kinds of communities, like you can always hear the defense of a, of a piece of writing that's like, well, you know, um, this passage feels shallow or this passage feels boring and there's inevitably that person who's like, but maybe that's like a formal manifestation of <laughs> the ways that it's exploring that subject, yeah. um, which always feels like a little bit unsatisfying as a defense or at least there's always just gonna be the person who's still bored. Um, but I did want to tell, I, it was kind of two-sided. I wanted to present the ways in which the experience of addiction, which often in like a literary or cinematic context is presented as like full of drama, right? Either the drama of like dysfunction and things like just getting fucked up over and over again, or the kind of drama of like you know, a hallucinogenic trip and the way that it makes the world's um, uh, distort and come alive and sparkle and, and shape shift. And, um, and I also, uh, you know, I think it's connected to that relationship or that mythology that, that relates addiction and creativity in sort of reductive ways. Um, so I wanted to do justice to just like how addiction actually often gets pretty boring because it becomes the same, I mean it's many other things, but it kind of becomes the same thing over and over again. One of the clinicians I interviewed for this book described addiction as a limiting of repertoire, um, which was never a phrase I would have imagined, but I loved it once I heard it because it seemed to speak to that constriction, that quality of like kind of narrowing of scope. And so I wanted to, again, without writing a boring book, tell the story of how in my own life and other people's lives, like addiction actually just made the world pretty small and made the story pretty small. Um, and maybe that connects to your question as well, like how to kind of wrestle with those feelings of like uh, the inadequacy of your story, like that in a sense it's like t being willing to tell a story about addiction in which the addiction becomes quite repetitive is also gonna make room for people to see their own addictions in that experience rather than kind of contrasting their addiction to the like cinematic, like fast and furious, like I was in a car chase and then like a <laughs> cop punched me and then, you know, because uh, often it's not like that. It's like, I mean, or you know, for me it was like, uh, a bottle of whiskey under a futon. Um, so I think I both wanted to make room for, for boredom in the story of addiction and sort of insist on that, um, its presence, and also and also to sort of make room for the way that like sobriety wasn't um, immediately or absolutely a process of kind of becoming more vital and feeling more alive. Like there were a lot of like driving down icy Iowa highways looking at a lot of like desiccated snow covered cornfields in the middle of winter with my little hands like tucked into the heat vents of my Toyota like that was that was part of what sobriety was too was actually like reckoning with silence and um, the self and kind of the weird hard edges and discomfort of just living in your own skin hour after hour so I, I, I wanted exactly to try to bring that into the story, but in a way that wasn't hopefully sort of full of um, <laughs> despair, but was just saying like it can hold this and it can hold a lot of other stuff too. Did you see the, the thing that GQ published today, that thing? So GQ published this like, they interviewed like nine famous musicians like Steven Tyler and Trey Anastasio on getting sober. And you know, it was interesting, I was reading and, and they kind of wove it together almost like, and it was, their drunk logs were actually very, te like th they were consciously presenting those narratives as like, yeah, blah, 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 like sure I got kicked out of Antigua, but it was actually fucking boring, you know? And the interesting part, and like it actually, the recovery part was was fascinating and it, and it was the individual thing because they had had these rock star lives and how they recovered and why it was very different. And I. Yeah, I was really struck by that when I, um, when I read Billie Holiday's 
uh, memoir, Lady Sings the Blues, for the first time, which she, which she co-wrote, but that I was really struck by. I mean, Billie Holiday has been so relentlessly um, mythologized in all kinds of different ways, and I you know, write a bit in the book about how she was both part of this sort of mythic story of the addict as like dark, luminous genius, and part of another um, very different, very racialized story about the addict as villain. Um, but that in her own memoir, what I was struck by was the way in which she really seemed to want to honor the tedium of addiction, that like it was about trying to figure out where to get heroin, and it was about drinking gin for breakfast, and that she was like pretty committed to actually kind of peeling off the gloss. Time for maybe one last question, if anybody has one. Hi, I have a question for both of you, if that's okay. Does that, in writing so much about your lives, does that change the way you see the world? Like when you're used to curating your experiences, do you, I don't know, walk through your lives being like, oh, this is a thing to write about? Or like, how does that shift your worldview? Well, I was always so compulsive about writing all the time that actually, so this was a thing that drove me, like when I, w I was in the Peace Corps and this kid who, this man, this like 40 year old man, this kid, this man who really hated me, he would, um, he would always be like, you came here just to get material. And I was like, fuck you, man. Like, like everything I do, I write about, you know? Like I was like, I can't, I was like, I wish I wasn't this way. However, it's literally the only thing I can do. And so, there is a way in which, like this is, I've kept a journal, I mean, the thousand words a day started when I was 12, but I kept a journal ever since I was, you know, in third grade, and I can't remember any point in my life where I wasn't trying to write about whatever I was seeing. So it does, but in a way that I can't tell anymore. Um, but, it, but it is something that I feel ambivalent about, and I have started recently especially to, um, like arbitrarily block off large portions of my lived experience that I will never write about, um, just to rem just to remember what and, and actually it doesn't make me see those uh, parts of my life any differently. But I've been like trying to do it as a goal. <laughs> and uh, is it truly arbitrary or is it? Yeah, I think I think you know it's sort of like when you like for me like if you leave the house and just like don't take your phone that day. Like it's just like I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna wall wall this off to any to you know yeah, but it hasn't. But it, you, so far it doesn't feel like it's like shaped your. I don't think so. It just feels like experience. a good break from this mm -hmm. thing about myself that is good, but I that I don't always like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think probably my response shares something with Gia's in so far as like it's probably hard for me to imagine what it would feel like to go through life without thinking potentially of the kind of narrative it would make. But I'm not sure that that's entirely about the fact that I publish writing about my life. Like I think, I think there's like a way in which I think in terms of narrative. Like even if I never published a word, I think that my mind would still be sort of experiencing then something and then thinking about how I would tell the story of that something or how I would describe that place, even if it was for a different sort of receptacle than like a personal essay, right? It was just like how I would tell my roommate when I came home or how I would tell my parents or how I would tell, you know, my diary or how, you know, that, so that idea of like sort of understanding things by turning them into narrative um, is, it, it's, it's like fueled and, and deepened and reinforced by it becoming a vocation. But I think it's sort of hardwired a little bit deeper than that, like it kind of, for me, it feels connected to like, what is experience without language or something? Cause it's sort of so innate to, um, make it narrative, but I've been thinking a lot, like uh, maybe four or five years ago, I started to write some about um, art, which is not something that I, I don't have like a, a real background in art. And as I started to kind of look at more art and, and try to think about art, I realized how kind of pathologically dependent I am on narrative. Like whenever I would look at a piece of art, I would need to somehow understand it in terms of narrative. So like I spent some time uh, at Chinati at Donald Judd's installation out in Marfa and there's one uh, installation there that's just like um, an old barracks that's full of draw, like, it's like the sketches. most narrative resistant place yeah. in the world. Yeah. No, I really, it was, yeah, like, yeah. It was like an unstoppable it, force and an unbreakable wall. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I will make narrative out of these like, <laughs> relentlessly minimalist pieces that even refuse the 
adjective minimalist. Um, but the, yeah, it was like this, it was this Icelandic artist who had made these like, what kind of looked like just like plain white pieces of paper with some graphite lines on them, which I mean, that is itself a summary of how <laughs> sort of untrained I am when it comes to art. But, <laughs> but the, the whole place, that whole installation immediately came alive for me when the, the guide told the story of how this Icelandic artist had been working on those pieces and Donald Judd came to visit his studio while he was very much in process with the art and then just said, this is done. And the guy was like, oh, okay. And I was so interested by the power dynamics of that moment, like the kind of like, powerful voice of authority says this is already art and so somebody feels like affirmed and then something that like somehow wasn't yet art <coughs> becomes art. So I was like immediately interested in like these two men, what was happening between them in that moment, like yeah. how <laughs> one's identity is being constituted by the other. But I was like, oh, like somehow I'm still unable to relate to like the fucking white pieces of paper with the graphite. Like I have to take recourse in the, in the story somehow. So I think that's another way in which more through criticism rather than personal writing, but I've just been thinking about like who am I without that apparatus or like how deeply baked in is that sort of dependence on on something taking the insight taking the form of a story. <laughs>